Welcome to episode 24 of the Being There Dumb Out podcast. You are joined by David Bryant and myself, Matthew Delau. I'm going to read a passage from the, from the book, Grit, Why Passion and Resilience Are the Secrets to Success by Angela Duckworth. And this is from chapter two, Efforts Count Twice. Talent, he observed, is perhaps the most pervasive lay explanation we have for athletic success. It is as if talent were some invisible substance behind the surface reality of performance, which finally distinguishes the best among our athletes. And these great athletes seem blessed with a special gift, almost a thing inside of them, denied to the rest of us. Perhaps physical, genetic, psychological, or physiological, some have it and some don't. Some are natural athletes and some aren't. Skipping further ahead. A theory is an explanation. A theory takes a blizzard of facts and observations and explains in the most basic terms what the heck is going on. By necessity, a theory is incomplete. It oversimplifies, but in doing so, it helps us understand. If talent falls short of explaining achievement, what's missing? I have been working on a theory of the psychology of achievement since Marty scolded me for not having one. I have pages and pages of diagrams, filling more than a dozen lab notebooks. After more than a decade of thinking about it, sometimes alone and sometimes in partnership with close colleagues, I finally published an article in which I lay down two simple equations that explain how you get from talent to achievement. Here they are. Talent multiplied by effort equals skill. Skill multiplied by effort equals achievement. Talent is, talent is how quickly your skills improve when you invest effort. Achievement is what happens when you take your acquired skills and use them. Of course, your opportunities, for example, having a great coach or teacher matter, matter tre- tremendously too, and maybe more than having more than anything about the individual. My theory doesn't address these outside factors, nor does it include luck. It's about the psycholo- psychology of achievement. But because psychology isn't all that matters, it's incomplete. Still, I think it's useful. What this theory says is that when you consider individuals in identical circumstances, what what each achieves depends on just two things, talent and effort. Talent, how fast we improve in skill, absolutely matters. But effort factors into the calculation twice, not once. Effort builds skill. At the very same time, effort makes skill productive. To close off, the separation of talent and skill, Will Smith points out, is one of the greatest misunderstood concepts for people who are trying to excel, who have dreams, who want to do things. Talent you have naturally, skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. I would add that skill is not the same thing as achievement either. Without effort, Your talent is nothing more than your unmet potential. Without effort, your skill is nothing more than what you could have done but didn't. With effort, talent becomes skill, and at the very same time, effort makes skill productive. (sighs) So, working in sport, and I guess being a participant in sport yourself, David, effort kind of gets push forward a lot like you know people have skill but effort factors in a lot in terms of how we can get better and, and like that like it said there Angela said it makes skill your talent productive so you explain a little bit I guess in your kind of situation effort is a lot like you almost effort almost drives you into the ground a lot of the times especially all that training you do just beating yourself up is it we would say that talent in your kind of con- context how like how is are people talented in in a marathon like running marathons triathlons or is it just kind of a lot of effort and genetics like it said as well outside factors yeah it's very ironic that you you read that piece today because i'm always on the lookout for for quotes yeah to put up on my wall and inspire myself and others and um i came across the the quote that talent makes you good mm-hmm. but hard work or effort makes you great so um, yeah, I think that's very true. And 
you know, the last year training with the elite triathlon Australia squad, I still don't quite see myself as an athlete. I just see myself as someone that's happened to work pretty hard to turn myself into an athlete the last year in particular. Um, yeah, through through hard work more than anything. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So let's let's probably get a better picture of yourself. So let's go back to the start. Like, does it kind of not probably not so much? Probably as a young young kid, I guess. It like, what got you into sport and and all of that. So I think I was talented from a ball sport point of view. Yeah, right. Um, and when I was young, as I was club footed, um, you know, I guess speed and power didn't matter as much when I was yeah. in my primary school years. And yeah, I do actually think I was quite talented from a cricket, rugby, AFL, soccer point of view. Yeah. And it wasn't until I reached high school um, when people start to grow and mature a lot more than me. Um, and probably to be honest, I didn't have as much effort and didn't work as hard that I sort of moved away from the the ball sports because I was mm-hmm. basically getting beaten up. And um, then I started slowly moving into the running scene. When I when I was fifteen, um, they realised that the difference between my left leg, my my strong leg, and my club foot, my right leg, was about an inch and a quarter, um, and my left leg was growing too too fast for my right okay um so to ensure the disparity between my two legs didn't become any more apparent they actually operate on my good leg to ensure the the growth wouldn't become any more apparent and just for rehab after that knee operation i just started doing 20 minute jogs for rehab and started to enjoy my running and slowly those 20 minute jogs turned into 20k jogs pretty oh, pretty gosh. quickly and <laughs> i was lucky enough to go to um, nudgy college in brisbane which is a big prestigious all boys school yeah. in Brisbane and um, the top 12 runners of the school got presented with a singlet in front of the whole school and got to represent um, their school at the all schools cross country um, and I got that 12 singlet and yep. yeah I still got that singlet today and that's where my running really flourished and I did work out that through effort and yeah. effort alone just ticking the box every day um, that you know the world's your oyster into how far you want to reach that and yeah straight after school I moved to Perth and you could say I didn't really know anyone <laughs> so all I had was running and I kept jogging and yes again my, my passion for running kept growing and for those that you know live in Perth you can see why it's such uh-huh. a big running and triathlon culture here and kept kept loving the sport and um, got into running I've done marathons all around the world and then it wasn't until probably 2015, just before the Rio Paralympics, that the um, Triathlon Australia team approached me to try and qualify for the Rio Paralympics. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I didn't have much of a swimming background, so I threw myself into the deep end there. <laughs> and I'm probably still fighting the water to this day, yeah. playing catch up. Um, and I got classified for the Rio Paralympics. And all of a sudden, things were looking pretty exciting for the Rio Paralympics. Um, but the para Olympics classification system there's always a lot of gray area Mm. in terms of trying to deem who's eligible for which particular class based on ability Um, and someone protested and I got declassified (laughs) and um, my only other option to get reclassified for Rio was to fly all the way over to Spain because there's not many classifiers worldwide that can you know deem you eligible or ineligible so flew all the way over to Spain hoping that I'd get classified and then do a race over there to gain points for Rio yep. um, Paralympics and did the whole classification system. And again, back then, given that triathlon was its first time in the in the games, the classification system still had a lot of gray areas. And yeah, I missed out on the classification system by 2%. So yeah, I can remember walking around uh, Spain aimlessly by myself, <laughs> not able to race and yeah, pretty down and out, but um, triathlon's a passion of mine and I was never going to give it up. And I think, you know, um, my advice to anyone trying to look for a, you know, a way to get fit is to find a sport they love because if you find a sport you enjoy, you're you're going to be consistent and it's going to be a lifelong routine. And I kept doing running and triathlon back in Perth and um, came fifth at the state sprint champs in the able-bodied um, championships oh, wow. back in uh, 2017. And then the classification system changed um, for the Tokyo Paralympics. Um, And back in 2018, I finally got reclassified for the Tokyo Paralympics. Um, So that only left me about two years to to qualify for the Games. And it's been a bit of a whirlwind trip since. And yeah, here I am now. I'm a Tokyo Paralympian. That's awesome. (laughs) So 
I guess kind of taking it back, does it how does it kind of the, the whole classification like system work? So how come you're like, like eligible and then well, obviously someone wants to put their hand up and like, hey, he's not can't really be in that class. Is that how it works or Yeah, so the classification system's a lot better now. There's a lot less subjectivity. Okay. Um it's a lot more scientific and okay. you know, they're open to using objective data in terms of power files, um, DEXA scans, oh, yep. MRIs, that sort of thing. Um, whereas previously, I guess you could argue that you could, you know, somewhat fudge the, the testing in terms of, you know, push, push my leg up against my hand and now let's compare the other leg and we'll sort of give it a scoring system. And then that classification makes it fair for everyone else in that each category. Yeah. So I'm, I'm PTS five category. Um, and we're basically the, the most able-bodied of the, of the triathlon class. Um, I mostly race people with out hands or fingers i guess you could say okay um there's a couple of other athletes that have a leg impairment like mine um yeah. but yeah i guess you could call where the where the bits are class um because we've got a mixed bag of yeah. various impairments okay and you explain to those who don't know what club foot is would you have to say explain that to people um the best way to describe it is kind of like being pigeon toed um yeah. so i've got an inch and a quarter leg length difference a three size shoe difference and about a 20 percent <laughs> difference in muscle mass and I oh wow I can't 20%. really, yeah. Wow. I can't really dorsiflex either. Um, okay, so that's bring the toes up, to, yeah, to or bring your whole foot up to your knee. Exactly yeah. right. Um, but ironically, running's running's my thing, and wow. I've never let it hold me back. And over the years, I've sort of dabbled with orthotics and corrections yeah. and all those sort of things. And I've gotten to the point where I feel that my body knows no other way. And yeah, <laughs> run without orthotics or anything like that. Oh wow. I'm I'm pretty lucky touch wood that I, I rarely get injured as well. So yeah, it's Oh really it's, so no like overuse. No, nah, it's really it's, it's funny how the body awesome. adapts or yeah, knows no other way. And how old were you when you had that surgery to correct the length of your I was fifteen. Uh, fifteen. Yeah. Now, do you remember much do you like understand at well, did you understand at the time what like how invasive, how what really was gonna happen? How much were they yeah, gonna so take they, away? They drilled through the growth plate of my left knee. So Oh, okay. So yeah. it stopped her from growing. Yeah. Um I'm nudging on six foot. I'm not quite six foot, so <laughs> it's a shame that I never made the six foot six foot mark. But it's um, opened up to so many other avenues as a result. Well, that's yeah. Well, obviously, how much? How many? You said how many inches difference? Inch in inch. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's almost worked out pretty well. It's yeah, and, and it's funny. Um, it's one of those sliding door moments. I don't think yeah. I ever would have gotten into triathlon if I hadn't moved to Perth and. I don't think I'd be as fit as I was either yeah. if I um, didn't have a club foot. So yeah, everything happens for a reason. Was that is that a, a typical type of um, surgery for someone with club foot to have that? Because obviously, it had to be picked up early. And yeah, I've, I've never no. really looked into it. Yeah, um, I, I do a lot of work with inspiring other club footers yeah. to make them realize that you know you don't have to let a club foot hold you back but i've never actually looked into whether other um, club foot athletes have had to have the same operation as me to ensure your good leg doesn't um grow too fast for <laughs> yeah. you right so you are got into the running early on <laughs> how much does training take into account like when you when you were younger was it just going out and running long distances and and doing like running long distances and doing all sorts of other things and then coming over here and having a structured program what was the kind of difference that you saw in in results so i i moved into floriot which backs onto perry lakes yep. and the west australian marathon club um for i think over 30 years on a tuesday night have had the their running intervals on a tuesday night okay. um and their running coach john kapler um i met and yeah, I, I owe a lot to John because, um, yeah, straight away, even though I was hardly elite, he invited me to uh, start jogging with his elite running group. And, you know, before I knew it, I was running with some of Perth's best runners and oh, wow. triathletes on a Tuesday and Thursday night for intervals and then doing a long run along uh, Cottesloe on a Sunday morning. Um, and Johnny and I still have a great friendship to this day. We've we've done marathons all around the world, such as Goodness. Berlin and Zurich. Oh wow. Um, Berlin, for example, the day I raced, um, there was a million spectators. So running through the Berlin gates, that was an amazing experience. Um, my PB marathon is two hours forty eight. So for those that don't know, that's about three fifty nine a kilometer pace for, for forty two gate forty two Ks. Um oh so again, God. I don't I don't let the uh the club foot hold me back. Oh my God. <laughs> so how many days a week 
would you try? Would you have, like do you train to get like a, a time like that? That's day daily runs or. There were some weeks back in the day where I was probably nudging 140k of running a week. Shit. Um, so that's that's my target goal when you space that out over the week. Yeah. So typically okay. a, a long run on a Sunday might be yep. yeah 30 odd k. Um, Tuesday Thursday is typically your, your double run day where you might do an easy jog in the morning and then an interval session um, in the afternoon. Yeah. And then if you do your Wednesday midweek long run as we like to call it, which is about <laughs> 15 to 20k. Um, and then a couple of easy runs Monday, Friday, and Saturday mm-hmm. before you know it, it mm-hmm. adds up pretty quick. Goodness. <laughs> so would you ever, just kind of bring in my little bit of a sports science back, would you ever kind of do a faster type runs in there as well to kind of pace, kind of go over that race pace type? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in the polarized training method yeah. whereby you keep your easy easy and you keep your hard hard. Yeah. And as a triathlon coach myself the biggest mistake i see athletes make is going too hard too often and running Mm. in what we call the gray zone whereby you're not really running easy enough to promote recovery and drive adaptation but you're not really going hard enough to actually gain speed so you know if i go out for an easy run these days i might go five five ten or even five thirty pace some some days but you know my intervals 1k intervals for example are 310 Mm. 320 pace so you can see there's a big differential between my, my fast and my easy, but I rarely run in between because, yeah, you're not really getting yeah. anything there. You're overstressing the system yeah. unnecessarily um, and you're not getting any speed either. Benefit, yeah. Could you Would you would you say that you were, I guess, physiologically like your body adapted or kind of your fit from a young age and that kind of helped along that way or you really had to work on the fitness? That kind of makes a sense. Like, you know, you, know, you get footy players, I guess, who – are like a, are, I guess a naturally speed athlete, or they just really have to work on getting endurance into them. Definitely no fast twitch vibe yeah, in this you, body. Yeah. I was the <laughs> I was the kid that um wag school or chucked a sicky on the athletics carnival or swimming carnival <laughs> days. Um, I was just always interested in ball sports, and it wasn't yeah, until right. yeah late later in the years in high school that yeah endurance slowly mm-hmm. became my thing, but. Yeah, I definitely had zero talent there. It was yeah. just literally down to being consistent day in, day just out. Just training hard. Mm. I guess, is it, what type of, type of mentality does it take like to kind of just, because sometimes I just go for a 10-minute run. I'm like, I'm done. Like I'm <laughs> like for me, running is like probably like your walk pace, but like just to go out and be like, I'm going to run 30Ks, my little Saturday long runs, 30Ks. Is it kind of gone to the point now where it's easy? Like I think, I was just, I think the me. biggest mistake people make is they perceive someone like me that every time I run out the door, you know, I'm running on Mm. my limit and every day I'm run, I'm trying to run faster than I did the day before. Um, And it's the exact opposite, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the 80, 20 rule whereby 80% of your weekly training volume should be relatively low intensity and just 10 to 20% of that volume each week um, should be hard because, Mm. you know, if you're pushing yourself every day, Physically and mentally, you're just going to cook yourself. Whereas you're periodizing your training and you're being smart about it, your body's going to recover and adapt. Um, but mentally, you're going to actually enjoy it as well. So, yeah, my my number one bit of advice for anyone trying to get into endurance, um, running, swimming, riding, triathlon, is just to go easy more often. Because yeah, life's stressful enough, and if you're doing your hobby and it's stressful, um, no one wins. Mm. How about how about um like that inner competitiveness in yourself? Do you find it hard to hold yourself back when it's like, oh, I need to go a bit slower or oh, you know, one, you know, you might have hit a PB a couple of sessions ago and then it's like, oh, you feel like you always need to kind of get yourself, like always one up yourself. Is yeah, everyone everyone loves the Garmin these days and yeah. uploading Strava. Um another tip I tell all my athletes is to turn the one K um markers off no. your garmin just because you don't need that constant yeah. feedback and a lot of the time it is dictating you know, you know the mentality of your run as to whether you're enjoying it or not whereas yes. if you just turn those 1k markers off and hit start and stop and enjoy the beautiful scenery perth has um yeah you're definitely gonna enjoy the run a lot more yeah because that's a good point because because you hear it back or if like you know i sometimes have the I'm more track more like my gym sessions and stuff like that. So if I see one session, you know, I'm benching 110 and like for four reps and then 
the week, the next week I've got threes, but I can only do one ten again. I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of, you don't really need to be chasing the numbers. It's more about getting in and, and moving the body, I guess, more or less. Yeah. I, I see every session as a sheet of paper um, and we're just trying to add as many, many layers to that booklet as mm. possible. Mm. Um, one day might not make or break you, but if we accumulate a lot of sheets of papers over time, all of a sudden mm. we got a really good foundation. So yeah. that's the analogy I work off rather than trying to be a hero every day. Yeah, it's all momentum as well. If you like, just I guess there will be days as well for you, it would be hard to put the runners on, but like even if it takes 30 minutes to put the runners on, you've got them on and it's time to go run. You just got to keep adding. Yeah, I'm a big believer in front ending the day, whether yeah. that be from a nutrition point of view, but also training point of view. Um, yeah. Most people that know me know that my alarm goes off at 4 a.m. Um, but that that's what works for me mm. because I know life's least likely to get in the way at that time of the day. And yeah, trying to juggle training, my own business. I've now got a two-year-old um, daughter, Audrey, mm. with my wife, Leah. Um, so yeah, that's the least invasive um, time of the day to o'clock. get things done. <laughs> well, that's actually not too bad now, Perth at this time of year, because the sun's up at four o'clock or is it, it's almost up at four o'clock, is it? Almost. Yeah. I invested in a head torch, um, for winter this first time. Um, yeah, goodness. I never thought I'd do that, but, um, great investment because I, I would have hated myself if I rolled my ankle in the dark in the lead up to Tokyo. Um, and yeah, I've, I've run a personal training group fitness session for probably about 15 years now um of about 10 to 20 ladies around florida um yeah. i do that at 5 45 monday wednesday friday and yeah, awesome. i get my run done before then so oh. yeah it, it forces me out of bed as well um, yeah. to get the run done does it surely there'll be days that are hard to kind of get up and but you, you always do it or the days are you kind of take oh, yeah. a bit easy we all, we all have our battles. Um, <laughs> I'm a big lover of cup, coffee first thing in the morning. Yeah. So when that alarm goes off, my, my first Shut incentive is a, is a good cu- cup yeah. of coffee and, and reevaluate from there. But yeah, good clothing goes a long way. Yeah. Um, you know, little things like good gloves in winter. You know, oh. I find if, you, if your fingers are warm, um, it goes a long I way. I see extremities, yeah. Mm. It's all about the, um, I've been kind of learning about the Palmer. I've been learning the opposite way, like Palmer cooling. Mm-hmm. You say you have blood your blood vessels, there are different type of capillaries that you have in um, your glabrous skin. So it's a skin that doesn't have any hairs on it. So like the palms of your hands, mm-hmm. your forehead, mm-hmm. and then the bottoms of your feet. And so what happens, what I've been doing research on is, um, say if you do like a set of dips and you go max reps mm-hmm. and you kind of put your hand like this is a glove and it has a circulating water through it. Mm-hmm. So it's not ice cold water, it's cooling water. Mm-hmm. cools down the blood. You it cools down the blood and cools down your core body temperature, and then as you go back to do your second set of dips to failure, you can do almost the same, if not more, reps than you did the first set. Which, if you've ever done sets to failure before, you usually do less in your second set and your third set than you do in your first set. Yep. And they've been saying they've been doing stuff with um, the forty nine, the San Francisco forty nine has been doing stuff intervals. So if you come off, so if you're a, uh, defensive team offensive team you come on go off put the glove on recover and then you're able to go on perform at a higher intensity so and if you if you i don't know if you had a grandparent who might have said when you were sick and you were burning up you lie down with a cold yeah, flannel on your head yep, yep. to cool cool you down face, or, face washer on the floor. yeah yep so sort of things like that kind of helping yeah well in in tokyo um we were using a special headband um it was like Ooh. a volcanic rock whereby you dip it in ice cold water mm. and then wrap this headband around your forehead. Yeah, it sounds like it was a similar concept. Yeah, interesting. Because I say you don't want to do is like you don't put your hand in ice or anything like that because then it constricts. It constricts yeah. yeah. And they say the ice, you've seen ice vests and stuff like that. That's That doesn't have the same or doesn't use the same kind of uh, uh, blood vessel system as what it has in your hand. So you're not able to cool the blood mm-hmm. as quickly. Well, yeah, that's kind of a little interesting Very kind interesting. of fact that I'm learning. <laughs> um, so, have you heard of? Um, you obviously know Jock, Jocko Willink. Yep. Yeah. So you you, you get up earlier than him. You process four thirty, <laughs> and you get a four o'clock alarm. You yeah. challenge him on it. Yeah. Well, I'm famous on Strava. Oh, yeah? <laughs> um, I, I, I've got the I've got the O four fifty club. Oh. It's an exclusive club. It's just me that runs at O four fifty club. <laughs> But that's my Strava title for most uh, of the, the runs I do. Oh, for 50 Club. Oh, there you go. You won't be seeing me on there. That's too early. Welcome anytime. Uh, so 
But it, I always say, because I get up at 5, 5.30, mm-hmm. do you always have your clothes right by the bed ready to get up and get dressed? Yeah, bag packed, and back, uh, yeah. car ready to go. Everything even little, needs to be Even organized. little things like the kettle full <laughs> so that you don't have to put water in it and just flick the switch. Um, just go zombie mode. Like just, yeah. you know, least, yeah, think the least you have to do in the morning. Path of least yeah. resistance. That's the one. So, yeah, ready to go. Wow. So, where, so the transition from running marathons into doing to do triathlons was it seamless was it like okay I, I, was it your approach to do the triathlon by triathlon australia mm. was it as easy as yep easy I'll, I'll do it it was a bit more of a thought you had to think about it long and hard oh i'm still thinking about it every day <laughs> <laughs> um my one regret as a child was not swimming um, yeah, okay. yeah i'm still playing catch up in the swim um the rider picked up pretty quick um and obviously um I guess my club foot is less impaired being yeah. on the bike. Bike's probably one of my strongest um, disciplines now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, every day I'm in the pool um, at the WA Institute of Sport, still pinch in myself that I'm, yeah, sharing a lane with some of the Olympic swimmers at the WA Institute of Sport. That's pretty cool. And, yeah, still learning that craft, that's for sure. So what is it about the swimming that's hard? Was it just getting the learning it okay, or doing it? more the resistance in the water obviously it's very technical yeah. um and yeah just just haven't had the time in the pool yeah. um and also probably a lot of head noise as well um mm. for whatever reason i always when, whenever it gets tough in the pool in the past i'd convince myself that you know i'm going slow and you know why are you doing this whereas you know when when it gets hard on riding and running i just sort of embrace it embrace it and accept that it's hard because i'm going fast so in the lead up to tokyo i actually did a lot of work with a, a sports psychologist mm. um, and i think that's been one of the biggest game changes for me um, from a performance point of view on the pool is the, the mm. psychology side of things as well because yeah when you're looking at that black line <laughs> it really is just you and you and the black nine and the head noise that goes with it that's one thing in swimmers that always it's like you are looking at that laugh because it's like you, the, the only thing you've got is that black line especially if you're doing What's the, the, the 1,600 meter swim that they do? 1,500 meter. 1,500 yeah. meter swim. That's crazy. Like you do that's all you've got. You look over your shoulder every two or three strokes. But yeah, that's and, an, and the times that they dish out for that 1,500 mm. is just phenomenal. But even trainings too, they're up at so they're up, you know, same time, four o'clock, and it's freezing cold in the water and it's that black line. Yeah, and I'm so lucky that triathlon is such a, a an awesome sport whereby you, you can so explore can, and. Yeah social train outdoors pre-covid you know i was racing and traveling all all over Mm. europe and seeing amazing scenery so yeah triathlon is is a sport whereby you you see athletes retire and they still keep keep doing it just because it's it's such an inclusive sport and yeah the scenery is amazing yeah so this with swimming i guess because it's like the sport of triathlon so swimming's at the start the first event was that kind of another you know, bit of a hard kind of transition because you know the weakest kind of weakest point of the the race, I guess, is at the start. And you're playing catch up. You feel like playing catch up. Yeah, the, the saying in triathlon goes that a, the swim's not going to win you a race, but yeah. yeah, but you could lose it. Um, and yeah, the the Tokyo Games, the the water temp interestingly was 31 degrees, so it was like swimming oh, wow. in a bath. And Ew. for the first time ever in you know a world series race so i was i was in the main pack um up until about the 500 meter mark for tokyo um which i'd never been and yeah the last turning boy with about 250 300 meters to go i made the decision to take the most direct line back to the finish yeah. or the exit shoot yeah um instead of staying with the pack and in hindsight now i, sh- I should have stayed with the pack because swimming's a bit like cycling you, you get a really big benefit from drafting in a pack and yes yeah Instead of uh, coming out, you know, fourth place or so, I came out eighth. So, oh wow, yeah, lesson learned. Um, so there's some real positives and negatives from the Tokyo yeah. swim, um, and hopefully for the races to come, I'm, yeah. I'm in those main packs and definitely staying in those main packs, not not swimming on my own. Well, I guess that that's good that you were up in the main pack. And mm-hmm. does how much of a difference is it op- like open water swimming with everyone like are the percentage they're swimming on top of you? Yeah, it's all about finding the right feet yeah. and yeah, drafting. It's yeah. it's definitely not as um, exacerbated as cycling, whereby you're probably saving you know thirty percent power sitting behind someone. But yeah, you, you definitely it's definitely much easier sitting on someone's feet. That's yeah, for sure. Wild. So how uh, the breakdowns? You would give us a breakdown of the swim, run, and ride. 
So my race is a 7.50 swim, a 20K yep. ride, and a 5K run, all done in the space of an hour or thereabouts. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, Goodness. start out hard and hold on <laughs> for the next hour, and that was probably the um, the biggest challenge, making that transition in the Elite Triathlon Australia squad. Um, in between doing all my marathon runs and getting classified for Tokyo, I actually doubled with um, Ironman. So, yeah. Ironman's a 3.8k swim, 180k ride, and 42k run. So, Shit. previous those those races, it's all about staying within yourself all days, all day, and not overexerting yourself and saving energy and riding safely. Um, and then sprint triathlon is the exact opposite. It's about going as hard as you can and and not holding back. So yeah, wow, that's such a big difference. Yeah, and they really are completely different sports. Even yeah. though they're both triathlons. Um, yeah, yeah, complete diff- different kettles of fish. That's for sure. And even the training around it as well would be completely different. Yes and yeah. no. Ironically, I'm probably doing more hours than ever <laughs> for a one hour race. Um, but you know that's elite sport. Is it? Do you doing what's the difference in terms of the training? Like, are you doing more weights, more? sprint kind of training the different bit more specificity with the yeah. the swim bike run intervals um, ah, okay. a lot higher intensity but you know on the lead up to tokyo a normal a normal week for me was probably about 20 to 25k swimming two to 300 k's of riding and 60 to 70 k of running all spread across the week so about 25 hours of training a week when you combine a gym program as well yeah wow <laughs> so how does your gym gym program look what is it how specific They'll be going like, is it higher rep strength? They'll be doing more um, rehab type exercises. A mixture. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Michael Dobbin yeah. as my strength and conditioning coach at, coach at the WA Institute of Sport. And yeah, it's very targeted now. Um, for example, I might do um, leg press on my club foot um, to build up the strength on that side. And then I might be doing split lunges um, on my left leg because I can get much more range on that side. Okay. Um, about 18 months ago, I had an Achilles injury on my um, club foot side. Yep. And interestingly, we did a bit of testing on my left leg, which I thought was my strong leg. Um, and I couldn't even do a single leg calf raise. Um, so it's, oh, wow. it's amazing how you think you're functional um, from a swim, bike, run point of view. And then you do some simple tests in the gym and you realize mm-hmm. you're anything but. So yeah, calf strength's been a big one for me. And promoting that real spring off the feet for running fast for 5K. Mm. Wow, there you go. <laughs> That's gnarly. So, and you had the, and you also, is there, there's a difference because you've got the muscle mass difference. Do you have to do more um, hypertrophy to, um, training on the right side to bring it up or is it more... We know that's the difference, but doing more more hypertrophy work on that side isn't going to make much of a difference. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever be able to yeah. increase muscle mass on that side, um, but just trying to make it as functional as possible yeah. and work within my ranges. Yeah. Okay, so how about we go from the sporting side now to your education and going to uni diet, dietitian? Yep. Sports dietetics as well? Yep. So how did you get involved in that? Was that just because you were in sport already and that was kind of the pathway? Or Yeah, so when I moved to Perth, I decided to study um, commerce at UWA because I, <laughs> I was interested in business at school and loved that side of things. And yeah, pretty quickly found out that commerce wasn't for <laughs> me at UWA. I failed microeconomics miserably, uh, probably oh, wow. the first thing I've ever failed from an academic <laughs> point of view, um, and decided to take my second semester out of school off in 2007 and actually did my personal training course um Mm -hmm. and it was then that one of the instructors was studying nutrition at ecu and all of a sudden it just made sense to to study nutrition food's always been a big part of my family's life um my grandma had a restaurant in victoria up until she was probably nudging 70 um and my dad's always been a um a massive cook in our house um cooking amazing food and really appreciating good produce so yeah, food's always been a big part of my family and I don't know why it took for me to leave school <laughs> and fail microeconomics for me to realize that nutrition was um, was my thing. And yeah, kept doing my personal training um, business on the side whilst yep. I was studying and that was really good for me because I could earn some cash before uni and then, and then study and that really complemented what I was doing and um, did my master's of dietetics at Edith Cowan University and yep. 
Um, yeah, sports nutrition was always going to be what I wanted to do. I can remember doing my clinical placement for dietetics at all the hospitals and absolutely hated it. <laughs> that was never be that, that was never going to be yeah. me. And then I think one of the best things I ever did from my Catalyst dietitian, dietitian um, business was actually doing an Ironman. I can remember doing my yes. first Ironman, and I had a I had a good day. I had a lucky day. I went nine hours nineteen on debut, which yeah, for those that don't know, you know, that's probably looking at top fifty um, overall for most Ironmans around the world. Um, and then post race, I just did a nutrition report about how I yep. tied my sports nutrition side of things into into the race. And yeah, I, I kept the nutrition report what I thought was pretty basic and just just had food basically, and that just gained huge intrigue and this post-race nutrition report overnight um reached thirty thousand fo- people overnight on facebook oh wow this was this was back in the day where you could organically reach that that many yeah that many viewers <laughs> before you had to pay facebook and as a result to this day from that um ironman race nutrition report in 2016 i've been doing online nutrition consults word worldwide to oh wow various athletes and yeah i see i see a lot of endurance-based athletes all over all over Perth now oh wow mm-hmm. what was your um what was your kind of nutrition plan in that in keep that it life? simple that's yeah. for sure um I'm pretty famous for LCM bars in the endurance world in Perth oh, yeah. um if you ever <laughs> see anyone munching on an LCM bar these days um while well, they're running it's fair to say they've probably seen me Um, but i like to keep it as practical as possible um you know nutrition's always about context would i ever prescribe someone to be snacking on a lcm bar whilst they're at work probably not but um you know an lcm bar it's low fat it's low fiber it's low protein um so it's got a very low residual load on the gut so it's very easy to digest on on race day um, so I'm always trying to think outside the box as to how we can tie mm. real food into a race nutrition plan. Mm. So do you try to – so is there a protocol in terms of a daily structure that you kind of keep like in terms of hours before training or hours before race? you like to kind of have meal meals or like do you kind of have a structure that way? A race day kind of meal – Gotcha. Yeah, the old adage of never trying anything new on race days <laughs> is, is certainly true in triathlon. And these days, all the research now surrounding why people get gut issues um, centers around the trainability of the gut. So the okay. more we train our gut to digest a certain amount of fuel under this certain exercise stress, the more adapted it becomes. And I can remember when I first got into running in triathlon, I just, you know, I just have to look at food and I'd probably throw it up. Um, before or during a race whereas now because i've you know been training properly for 15 years and tying in nutrition in around training i could probably have a big mac before a hard 5k and not get any get any gut issues i'm not saying that's what you should have before yeah. a 5k but um yeah the gut is really trainable so when an athlete comes to see me for a race nutrition plan hopefully months out from the race um it's all about trialing our new race nutrition plan under race simulations um so that race day there's no surprises or gut issues yeah interesting so if so if in terms of say in a daily life for someone who has time constraints or anything like that they might have work and then the only time to train is probably got an hour window or whatever mm-hmm. even if they have you know might, something that's nutritious there might be you know, say a salad or something mm-hmm. might not have enough time to kind of clear the gut but you might feel heavy but as long as you keep doing it consistently and train, probably low intensity, try to just try and get through, you might feel a bit sluggish because you've got food in the gut. You're saying that you train in the gut with the food with food in it, your body gets used to it after a while, and then it become it will become easier to kind of process that food. Yeah, and again, it, the types of food you choose yeah, also play a big factor in you know how how digestible those to something less yeah. fiber. Exactly right. So if an athlete's rolling out of bed first thing in the morning and it's a relatively low intensity, therefore there's less of a carbohydrate demand. Yeah. So, you know, fueling's not as essential. Mm-hmm. Whereas if they're rolling out of bed and they've got a high intensity session, that really increases that carbohydrate demand. So a lower fiber option such as, you know, white mm-hmm. toast or a crumpet or something like that, like that pre-training is going to fuel for the work required. So again, it's all about context. And then on the flip side, if they have a, 
high intensity session in the afternoon. Again, afternoon tea should be pretty simple from a carbohydrate point of view. Whereas if they're not training in the afternoon, that's where I'd encourage something a bit more nutritious in the form of maybe a protein shake, some yeah. yogurt, some fruit, some nuts, some soup, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Because your sport takes up a lot of carbohydrates as well, do you kind of, and even protein for recoveries, do you want to make sure that you prioritize your protein after trainings or after trainings and after um, competition as well? It's it's definitely both. Yeah. Um, we want to begin a mix of not only protein for muscle rebuild and repair, but yeah. also carbohydrates to replenish the glycogen we've depleted. Um, I'm a massive fan of milk after training. Yeah. Milk's the perfect ratio of three to one, carbohydrates to protein. Milk's hydrating. Um, milk's got electrolytes and calcium. And there's even studies now which highlight that milk's superior to rehydrating us compared to water and sports drink alone. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, in that little you know, magical 30 to 60 minute window that we always talk about post-training, um, particularly when you know your next meal's over an hour away for whatever life reason, um, a flavoured milk or a nice coffee or something like that really is your best mm. friend. I always do after my um, Muay Thai because fin- we finish Muay Thai late around 8, 8, 8.30. I always grab my milk and protein. I think because I get up early again the next morning, I don't like to go to bed if I have a steak or whatever, usually I used to do it. Mm. And then my sleep would be horrible because I go to bed within an hour of eating. So now I just go protein shake and have a bottle of um, electrolytes because we're sweating like crazy. Yeah, so I'm always um, thinking practically for my athletes yeah. when they come to see me. So if they do have a late session like yourself, I might encourage an early dinner around 4, 5, yeah. 6 yeah, o'clock yeah, yeah. Um, to get all your nutrients in. Yep. Um, and then if they want to finish their training session and have milk with a protein shake or a smoothie, which Mm. is quick and easy and then get to bed, uh, I'm all for it. Mm. Have you, would you have you had much experience with intermittent fasting at all? Yeah, well, I I fast, you know, between lunch and dinner. Yeah. I I eat, I eat for, I eat and then I fast for two to three hours and yeah. (laughs) You don't do the whole, that eight window, the 16, no? No, I just don't, I just don't like the relationship it creates with food in that, you know, you must fast on this day and then on this day you can have yeah. whatever you whatever you feel. Um, it just creates that all or nothing mentality oh, yeah. with food. Um, and I'm just about context with food. So there's times and places in the week whereby, you know, your plate probably should look a bit more protein, salad, vegetable driven, whereby there's also some places in your week where, you know, having a Snickers bar post post ride pre run to feel for that work required is is appropriate and yeah you'll never be perfect with nutrition and not even i can follow my plan 100% yeah. of the time i again the 80 20 rule as long as you're being as consistent as you can 80% of the time um you know what you do 20% the other time is is completely fine and you know people come to me saying you know they've, they've been really bad over the last week and i'm like what have you done have you killed someone or you know <laughs> what what sin have you committed and they're like oh i had ice cream on on friday night and I'm, most of the time i say good on you yeah um, because yeah food's there to be enjoyed as well yeah do you you know you, you were saying it a food centered approach is there any supplements in there at all not in this day and age. Yeah. Again, sporting teams, institutes are, are that, I guess you could say, fearful of, you know, inadvertent doping yeah. and cross-contamination and all that. It really is a food-first approach. I think there was one stage at Waste where, you know, you had to get a medical clearance just to take Gatorade. They were, you yeah, know, right. that stringent with um, with supplements. Um, so, yeah, I don't really see the need to supplement mm-hmm. as long as our diet is adequate. Mm-hmm. I guess one that does spring to mind these days um, with endurance athletes a lot is is iron. Um, oh. Very very hard to maintain our iron stores through the physical pounding of the payment every oh. day because we're breaking red blood cells, um, and we're historically not very good at absorbing iron from red meat or vegetarian sources. Really? Yeah, as we probably a, only absorb about thirty percent of iron from red meat as as the population in general. Or? Yeah, and okay. then. Vegetarian sources, we um, absorb as little as 2 to 5% of iron from plant sources. So, yeah, if an athlete is low in iron, that's definitely a supplement mm. that I would consider. Have you tried? Um, I say this to everyone. I say this all the time on every podcast, so I'm sorry everyone is listening again. <laughs> um, organ meats, beef liver, have you tried that? Because that is 100% iron. <laughs> yeah. Like, all, all I taste is metallic 
Yeah, there's heaps of Instagram bodybuilders yeah. and all that eating organ meats, but I haven't got into yeah. that, no. <laughs> mm. It's nice. I've been trying it with um, – we're trying I've been doing it the last couple of days with onions, just like cooking mm-hmm. in, in butter and, and yep. onions. And then once the onions are cooked, kind of just take them out and then whatever's left in the pan, just put the liver in there, 30 seconds each side. But, yeah, and I have it along with my steak. Because I, I don't have a lot – I don't have like a big liver. It's yep. like a little slice, just – so I know I'm getting because it's packed pack full of nutrients. A, vitamin A. I know it's fat soluble full of vitamins. Iron. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. beef heart as well on the to do list. <laughs> Try it. It's, it. I feel um, you feel. I don't know. It's probably um, you know you're very just because you think you, you you know you're eating something good and you feel a lot better for it. So yep. there's probably the residual effect I get from it. <laughs> What's it called? The um, Placebo. You placebo effect, yeah. It's definitely uh, probably the placebo effect, but yeah. (laughs) So, no, so electrolytes, do you supplement with, is there a specific brand that you use? I'm lucky enough to have Bindi um, support me for electrolytes. Um, That's a local brand, um, homegrown in Bustleton. Um, So that's my main sports drink of choice. Um, Sports drinks are pretty similar these days from a carbohydrate electrolyte point of view. Um, okay. the biggest factor when an athlete comes to me is actually taste because there's no point in me <laughs> saying, Oh, you know, this electrolyte drink, it's amazing. It's got this much carbohydrate, this much electrolytes in it. You should drink it. If they don't like the flavor, they're not going to be drinking it, you know, mm. six, seven, eight, nine hours into an iron man, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, um, Bindi's great. It's got all the electrolytes and carbohydrates you need and, um, all natural flavors and yeah. tastes good. So Bindi's my preference, but yeah. Um, for the general public, my recommendation is to find that yeah. a brand that you like yeah. from a taste perspective. Do you have a specific, specific flavor that you like? Oh, the lemon lime yeah. is pretty pretty palatable. Um, but then that's my go-to. And then I think people. on a hot day, you also can't go past orange Gatorade. Yeah, um, there's just something about orange Gatorade straight out <laughs> of the bottle that yeah, I love. There you go. Do you no know, no um, gels or anything like that for my sprint distance race. No. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, we do carbohydrate mouth rinse in our yes. in our on, on the bike. So mm-hmm. my bike race or my bike leg of my race probably only takes about hopefully 27, 28 minutes. Um, so you know, we don't need an extra hit of carbohydrates on the bike. Mm-hmm. However, if we're having a small swisher sports drink when we can across the bike, um, that's having a stimulatory effect on the taste receptors, and the taste receptors then talk to the brain. And basically convince the brain that it's getting adequately fed, even though in the grand scheme of things, I'm having a very small amount over that period. And that stimulatory effect is lifting the mood and therefore boosting performance. So Interesting. yeah, there's quite a lot of a lot of research now surrounding the performance benefits of carbohydrate mouth rinse. So even if I'm doing a hard swim set in the pool and I don't have many options to actually sip the drink, yeah. I'll just take very small swigs when I can to have that performance benefit. Interesting, and, and no carbohydrate gets absorbed. And yeah, it's not, it's not of... the amount of carbohydrates that's having the effect. It's just that stimulatory effect of the taste receptors talking yeah. to the brain. So, yeah, from a practical perspective, if you know any of our listeners are doing a high-intensity session that's relatively short in their training week, um, I'd definitely consider just having that small yeah. swish. Is there a specific... So- High so high intensity. High intensity for yeah. how for how long? Is oh, it so less than an hour. Less than an hour. Yeah. So obviously, if we're doing you know an endurance event over an hour, for example, ingesting carbohydrates is going to be important so that we can sustain that intensity. However, for shorter events whereby ingesting carbohydrate isn't exactly beneficial, that small presence of carbohydrate in your mouth is yeah still having a performance benefit. Mm, yeah. Any sodium or anything like that? There's you don't cramp up anything most of the research in terms of cramps these days comes down to how fit you are so what we call, <laughs> there you go everyone all the footy guys who are listening yep yep so you're not fit enough get fitter <laughs> um so yeah exercise associated muscle cramping um which makes completely sense that you know if you're putting your body through a stimulus that it's never been exposed to before in training um and overworking it um of course it's going to cramp so yeah Hopefully, you as a strength and conditioner, are, you know, putting your players through as much, you know, match-specific mm-hmm. work as possible. And then secondly, the most common reason we actually cramp is carbohydrate inadequacy, which, again, makes completely sense that if you're not providing the body with enough fuel, particularly carbohydrates, mm-hmm. you know, towards the back end of a, of a match or a race, the, 
the muscle start to cramp. And then thirdly, but interestingly, there's not a huge amount of evidence. It's an electrolyte imbalance. Um, it certainly makes sense to yeah. start a match or a race um, hydrated, but the evidence is pretty mixed in terms of magnesium, um, sodium, that sort of thing. Mm, interesting. Do you, So in terms of kind of carbohydrate loading, is that much of a thing these days or is it more consistent nutrition leading up to a race? Because you don't want to, like you said, don't want to change anything. Yeah, so for my for. my race, which is an hour, I won't exactly carbo load yeah. like I would have back in the day for an Ironman for yeah. a 10-hour event. However, however, it certainly makes sense to make sure that I'm well fueled once I hit the start line. Um, so my day before nutrition is still going to be quite carbohydrate focused. Mm -hmm. And my day before nutrition, I'm really going to dial back the fruit, the veggies, the fiber, so that there's no residual load sitting in my gut on race day to further reduce the risk of mm -hmm. gut upset. So yeah, my pre-race and race day nutrition looks very different to, you know, a normal training day, okay. which has a lot more of a nutrient dense emphasis. Interesting. So like if you're looking at it from protein, carbs and fats are still the same, but the sources of food. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, probably a little bit more carbohydrate yeah. the day before, yeah. um, but I'll still be making sure I get an element of protein and yeah. healthy fats across the day. Yeah. And during the race, it's just the, the sports drinks. Like, sorry, we sorry to say um, the race you're doing at the moment, the sprint ones, that's just, Sports drinks? Yeah, I'm not really no. ingesting anything. Um, just yeah. because I'm going at such just a high should, intensity, yeah. um, I want to minimize yeah. any risks of yeah. gut upset. So, yeah, just very small swishes of sports drink. I guess, interestingly, for Tokyo, from a nutrition point of view, um, one of our pre-cooling strategies was a sports drink slushy. Yep. Um, not only yep. to to get the electrolytes and the carbohydrates in, but the internal cool, cool yeah. cooling effect through bringing the core body temp down internally. Um you know, things like towels, ice vests, those yeah. sort of things, they might make me feel cool, um, but they're not really bringing the core, core body temp down. So, yeah, yeah pre-Tokyo, I was um, dipped in an ice bath a couple of times pre-race and also having a couple of ice slushies to get that core body temp down as, as much as we could. How long before the race were you in the ice bath for? Um, I think my last ice bath was about an hour before yeah. the race, which um, for the test event in 2019 was was quite new jumping in an ice bath at 4 a.m in the morning and <laughs> basically shivering whilst the the air temp is you know mid 30s and high humidity um but yeah i was definitely better for it um yeah you felt the difference the, the heat affected me too much for tokyo mm. you you're saying as well in tokyo the water was 32 degrees 30 31 the, degrees yeah that must be a weird feeling because you go on the water here, it's freezing, but then going to that water must, yeah, like you said, it felt like a bath. Yeah, so on the lead up to Tokyo, I was basically living in the heat chamber at waste. Yep. Um, so they'll they're whacking it up to mid 30s and 80, 90% humidity. So if you factor in the feel like temperature, we were nudging 50 degrees. <laughs> so a great place for exercise. Um, and something else we were trying to do to drive that heat adaptation was, yeah, trying to find a a hot pool in Perth, which is quite difficult. So yeah. a lot of the time we're actually going to hot kiddies, 25 meter pools indoors. Mm -hmm. um, Cause a lot of the time they were, yeah, 30 degrees. So um, the kids could swim. Um, so yeah, we, we're just trying <laughs> to simulate race conditions as much as possible. But yeah, interestingly, I think the swim was probably the hottest part of the race because you yeah, care. Cause you, there's no rest. Yeah. You're not like get, you're getting the cooling effect from the sweat. You're basically anything. operating in a hundred percent humidity environment and, yeah, towards the back end of the swim, oh, I was I was really feeling yuck. it. <laughs> Damn, was it? You know, what kind of you? You said you you went with a sports psych. What was the kind of the messaging around getting over the the swim? Like, were we trying to trick yourself? Type like you trying to talk to yourself? A lot of was there type a lot of journaling, a lot of um, imagery, visualization. Yeah, I've tried all the above. Yeah. Um, one thing that worked really well for me was um trying to take emotion away from the swim um okay. and not overthinking it little things like you know two strokes four strokes two strokes four strokes two strokes four strokes <laughs> to, to focus on the the process rather than the outcome yeah or big one for me is you know over analyzing how fast i am or yeah. aren't swimming so trying to be less emotive was probably the biggest um pointer i took away mm -hmm. from the from the sports site because it's it's so different like a triathlon in terms of, you know, I come from team sport background. It's more even 
fight background as well. You got there's a winner and then there's a loser. Drive on like a sport like that. You're not really. It's not really a winner or loser. It's someone comes first and you got second, third, fourth, fifth all the way down. It, is it? Do you find it when you first started? Was it hard to kind of not be super competitive and always chase podium like first, second, third? Or how did you overcome that? We had not really thought about. It. Triathlon's one of those sports where I wouldn't say when you start out you you're trying to win. You're just yeah. trying to be better than you were yeah. yesterday, the week before, that sort of thing. And because there's so many nuances <laughs> in triathlon in terms of swim, bike, run, transition, yeah. nutrition, everything else that goes with it, it always leaves you wanting more. So, yeah, triathlon is quite a individual and almost selfish sport um, whereby winning isn't always everything. Yeah. Do you, like you said, try and nail down the transition times. Do you kind of, how, how does the transitions work? Like, do you get given a space in terms of this is where your bike is? And how is it ranked? Because obviously there's a bike that would be further away for someone than there's one really close. Yeah, but um, it's all even in the end because, you know, you might right rack your bike early, but then you've got to run further down the, the, the yeah, chute okay. once you're in the run leg. So that that's all even. But, yeah, again, transition's really important um, as to how quick you get off the bike, um, rack your bike, how quick you get your helmet on, yeah. how easily you can get your shoes on. Um, it, yeah, it, it played a big part in mm. the lead up. Do you have to train for that or do you kind of just... No, we, we, we were training yeah. for that, how how quick we could get the helmet on, how quick we were getting off the bike, um, you know, little nuances like how our elastics are for yep. our shoes, yep. baby powder to help get shoes yeah. on quicker. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so many it's little things that go into a triathlon. So in the in the lead up to Tokyo, was there, um, you know, like I say, like a Saturday long run, was there a day that you were kind of specific to do those three types of transitions in an actual training session? Yeah, we were doing race simulations yeah. in the heat chamber um, oh, at the WA Institute of Sport and VIS. So yeah. again, at both of those institutes, we were lucky that the pools backed onto the heat chamber. So yep. I do a, a race simulation in the pool and again, I'd be lucky at waist so I can get one of the waist swimmers to to sort of pace me yep. whereby I hold on to their feet for as long as possible and then I jump out of the pool and jump on the bike in the heat chamber and race at that intensity but also that heat and then jump on the treadmill. Um, yeah, lovely oh. place to run on a treadmill in, in a heat chamber. Yeah, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. So one of the things I want to talk about as well is take you back to the iron man how much of a mental battle was it to kind of no it's nine you said nine hours how was it nine hours third like, nine hours it? 19 nine hours 19 yeah. how much of a grind like you would have been battling yeah i guess physically on the start line of an iron man i'm probably less nervous because i know when the gun goes off it's like all right well you know off we go we've yeah got, we've got all day to sort of build into it and if I don't make the first swim pack to the first swim boy or, you know, I switch off for a minute or so, I've got another nine hours to rectify mm. it. Or, you know, if I if I drop my bottle on the bike, I can get another bottle later. Or, um, yeah, it's 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 a long training day, as I like to say, with all, <laughs> with all the bells and whistles that go with it. Yeah, That's okay. something I always remind the athletes I train that, you know, it's just a long training day with all the bells and whistles. And That's interesting. You're, you're fresher than ever. Yeah. Um, whereas yeah, sprint triathlon and a sprint triathlon at the Paralympics, um, it's, it's really cutthroat and yeah, um, little decisions can make or break you such as the, the decision I made with the swim. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely more nervous for a, a sprint triathlon, <coughs> ironically, than they are for men. Yeah. Well, is, is it, is a, a, um, mental battle when you have to kind of think, uh, you got nine because you know how long roughly it's going to take you. You go, I know I'm going to hurt at some stage, but I don't know when. <laughs> is that the the battle that's going in your head? Like, oh, that's the hardest thing to kind of. The saying in Iron Man is "death by a thousand paper cuts," so <laughs> you know it's coming, um, and it's just about managing it all from a nutrition point of view, pacing, so that yeah, you can hopefully finish strong in that in that last run. Mm. Is it? How do you? Is there a do you kind of draw on who like draw motivation in that in the run because that's obviously the hardest part at the end. Is it motivation or is it is it discipline? What are the kind of key kind of the main piece of advice I give to athletes that I um, provide coaching for is to enjoy the race, not just the finish line. You know, it's it's very cliche, but if you're just fixated on thinking how good that finish line 
is when you can finally call yourself an Iron Man. Yeah. Physically, but more so mentally, it's going to be a bloody long day. Um, whereas, you know, if you're giving yourself little pats on the back and going, oh, shit, that was pretty cool. I've, I've just swum around the Bustleton jetty or, yeah. you know, this is pretty good. I'm riding through the Bustleton forest. I'm taking in the scenery and now I'm on the run. I'm running past friends. I've got a crowd. Yeah. You know, it's it's going to be a much more enjoyable yeah. day. So you're not really, you're not counting down the Ks? Not as much. Um, to well, know. Obviously, taking- if you're at the point, pointy end of the field, you might be racing a little bit more, but... Yeah. You know, the large majority of people that do an Ironman do it to to say they, they've done an Ironman. Where did you do it? Did you? Bustleton. Yeah. Bustleton. Oh, so the weather's not too bad. Can be can be very hit or miss. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, December, um, you know, it can be quite a mild day or you could get a 40 degree yeah. day. So I've done a few down there where um, it's been absolutely, you know, stinker, 30, oh. 30, 35 degrees um and then the day i did it was quite a mild day so it's just luck of the draw but you know bustleton provides everything i remember one year um the swim got shortened because there was a shark oh. um someone hit a kangaroo on the bike and then there were bushfires all in one day so yeah <laughs> all in one day australia for you hey yeah wow that's crazy so did you how does it do you feel like you because of you're an iron man does it make what does it make you feel like in terms of inside, you feel happy, I guess, or obviously you feel happy, but what kind of feelings does that invoke? Oh, it's definitely a special feeling yeah. crossing the line after doing a 3.8K swim, 180K ride, 42K run. <sighs> um, so, yeah, you, you've got to in, got to enjoy it. And, um, yeah, you're definitely on a high for, for days on end, that's for sure. Yeah. What keeps you going? Um, my family, yeah. my friends um i guess there's a bit of ego involved as well um, (laughs) with my mates and you know showing that obviously my nutrition works um yeah i've got many motivations i wouldn't say there's any one motivation that keeps Mm. me going what do you kind of what does it take i guess to kind of be at the level i guess alongside you like did hard work discipline patience yeah patience everyone everyone wants it now in this day and age um and it's just about ticking a box every day again i always go back to that that sheet of paper one day might not make you might not break you um it's just about um simple things done well adding up to outrageous success Mm. and compounding over time Mm. there's a saying that um john wellborn says from power athlete he was a a 10-year veteran in the nfl and he always says Move, move the dirt every day, no matter if it's like a shovel or a little spoon, like a little teaspoon. You always got to put the work in and just move something every I love, day. I love it. Very That's true. Some of the ones. Mm. If you were going to have dinner with any four people, who would you want to invite? Anyone, anyone you can invite to dinner, who would you invite? Well, after living in a bubble for the last six weeks, um, going in and out of quarantine and doing the hotel quarantine thing. Um, I honestly just would have my family yeah. now. Um, it's, it's five weeks today since I left uh, hotel quarantine and I, the, the novelty still hasn't worn off. So, yeah, very yeah, yeah. cliche, but it'd be my family. Yeah, nice. Mm-hmm. Is there four people exactly? Are we going over the... Oh, maybe my extended family. Yeah. Nice barbecue, five. Yeah. Yep. Oh, lovely. That'd be me. Mm, what do we got on the menu? Oh, for those that follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I do a fire pit most weekends and um, oh, just, just cook fresh right. produce on the fire pit, um, grill some veggies on the fire pit. Yeah, yeah, simple salads. I'm really into Greek food at the moment. Oh, so lucky. Yes. Um, <laughs> I do a spit often. Yes. Um, my wife's mum um, has her 80th birthday party next week and we're hosting and we're having a Greek theme. Um, and we're having, a big, the, we're having a big spit, yeah. lamb spit for about 40 pit, uh, forty people, so it should be fun. Oh, yum. Well, that's a lot of people. Uh, we do it all the time. Good fun. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, so let's talk about go to Tokyo. Mm. <sighs> it's obviously so much different than it would have been in any other normal time, but did they make you feel like it was normal while you were there? Everyone was, I guess, all the – it seemed like all the – uh, volunteers and they're all yeah whilst we were unlucky about the covid situation yeah. we we're lucky that the japanese were the hosts um i think it's fair to say if it was rio um the the games probably wouldn't have gone ahead but the japanese people they're just so organized mm. um 
happy, friendly, <laughs> beautiful culture. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they still made it a very special games. I think everyone agrees that it would have been the best games ever if it was a normal games with the crowd. And one of the awesome things about the village was that it was smack bang in the middle of, the to- middle of Tokyo and every venue apart from I think it was the cycling was with, was within a 5K radius of the venue. So, oh, wow. you know, you, you just look out to the city and the skyline and just see venues everywhere. So, yeah, as disappointing as it was that we didn't have a crowd, even though triathlon was probably one of the lucky ones that because we were in racing in the city, we still had a bit of a crowd. Yeah, compared, so people can come and, and just... Yeah, compared to the, the venues that yeah. were... Yeah, completely empty. Um, yeah, it was, it was still a very special game for me. That's cool. And I guess because you're out racing, you get to see more of it than what other people... Try to take it on board as much as possible. Yeah. yeah the novelty was, yeah, leaving uh, the village to either go for a swim at the local pool or go the race. Apart from that, we were um, yeah. yeah in lockdown in the village. So how long were you there for total? It was about two weeks. So you were there the for village. two weeks. Yeah. And you raced at what in that two-week window? I think I flew in on the... Friday and then the Tuesday after was race day. Uh, so how does that, so from that time you flew into when you race, what was the kind of structure of your day? What did you kind of do? Did you train at all? Ironically, we were up at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that worked out well. Um, that was mainly to beat the heat yep. and also to initially ride in the village. Um, we got away with it the first couple of days and then the, the Japanese put a stop to us riding on the village from a safety point of view. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we were back riding on the indoor bikes, um, but that was just, some, you know, something we had to roll with the punches. Um, and, yeah, just try to keep as much of a normal training routine yeah. as we could. But, again, front-ending our day to get training done the morning and beat the heat and, yeah, yeah stay away from the heat for the late afternoon. So you just ride on the bikes just to kind of get used to the feel? Yeah, just keep, just keep the body touch, moving. Yeah. Slightly touch a bit of intensity so that you're, your legs and lungs and everything else are ready for race day. But yeah, yeah within that 10 day period yeah. out, you, you definitely can't gain fitness. You can, no. yeah, just get as fresh as you can. Yeah. Would you take advantage of like the, the ice, like the recovery stuff as well? I think they would have had those pants and all that sort of stuff there. Yeah. Australia by far had the best setup in the village. Yeah. Um, we basically had a whole building complex to ourselves, and the bottom floor was physio, massage, um, dietitians, <laughs> um, we were pretty much the only country that weren't allowed to go to the dining hall. So we missed out on the whole dining really? hall experience because um, they deemed it a heightened COVID risk, um, which is a bit of a shame. But um, the benefit was that we had full catering service within our building. So oh, you know, okay. the days when you trained or just wanted to roll downstairs and get food and go back up to your room, you could do that. Whereas, yeah, if you're walking back and forth to the dining room three, four times a day, which was probably about a 1K turnaround walk, it, um, it would have added up. So, yeah, it probably worked out for the better mm. in the end. Did it get tempting <laughs> to try different things or to have foods that didn't fit into? I love, yeah, enjoying all different foods and cultures and all the experiences that go with it. So it was very tempting to go into the dining hall. But, um, yeah, didn't want to put any other as- athletes or myself at risk, that's for sure. So you did it. But what about after the race? Did you explore different foods after? Uh in the in and our little cohort, but yeah, still yeah. still weren't allowed to go to the dining hall. Yeah, but well. but they, they so in the catering, would they have different types of food? They did as much as as we could, and yeah. yeah, probably let my hair down a little bit, but um, <laughs> yeah, still kept a routine. Oh wow, that's funny. No desserts. They didn't give you any desserts or anything like that. Oh, there was a lot of yogurt and ice cream. Yeah, um, but yeah, they were a little bit limited as to what they could provide to us. With, your, with the fridges and all that they had available. But the, the dietitians did a great job, that's mm. for sure. So you came, you said you came fifth? Seventh. Seventh. Mm. Does that make you feel proud that you were seventh? I'm proud mm. that I pushed all the way to yeah. the end. Um, again, there were some good and bad aspects of my race. Really happy with the ride. Had one of the fastest rides of the day and matched the world time trial champion. Oh. Um, the run had a bit of a stitch on the run probably only get a stitch once every 18 months um and it happened to be on race day um one of the theories with why i'm more susceptible to a stitch is because of my leg length difference um and that friction between the diaphragm and the rib cage as a result Um, because yeah as you're running in the muscle yeah interesting Um, so we did a bit of background work to try and prevent the stitch um pre-race but um yeah it still happens so yeah, that's one of my b- biggest regrets from the Tokyo race, but yeah, I still push to the end. How do you, what do you do, or what do you do to prevent? 
uh, we actually had a cortisone on one of my on my right side of my rib cage okay. pre race because it typically happened more more so on my right side. Yeah. Um, but of course, race day it happened on my left side. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, stitch is one of those weird things where yeah. like everyone has a different theory as to why they mm. happen, and no one really quite knows why. So yeah, we're looking at trying to get stronger in the gym so there's not as much twisting and friction with yeah. the rib cage. Um, and that's our main avenue at the moment. That's interesting. Mm. Never would have thought that. Mm. So other people, when they're thinking it's food or it's water. A lot of people think it's food, hydration, that sort it's of thing. Really. But, yeah, you'd like to think me with my dietetics expertise and all the other dietitians that helped me that, yeah, I don't think it was a food or a hydration. You probably, yeah, you'd almost be one of the prime candidates because you train so much and you, you obviously know your diet's on point and you'd be pretty – um, discipline with the with, with your food timings and yeah. when you train and that, so yeah. you know the difference. It's crazy that it's he had had one for almost eighteen months, and then that one day, yeah, unlucky. Hmm. But you know that's racing. But you know, I beat a few people I've never beaten before hmm. in the race, and learn a lot from the race, and a lot of things I learned in that race. Um, I would have learned if I had the opportunity to race a bit more in the lead up, but yeah, we we're obviously hindered by COVID. Um, so yeah. More motivated than ever to keep pushing for Paris and look forward to hopefully racing uh, next year. Could have, because obviously the racing in the the element of the humidity as well. The, how much of that do you think? Like, do you feel like that you were adequately prepared? For yeah, the, I was. It's more the. I was doing heat adaptation yeah. work for basically two years, so <laughs> it's hard to say. Yeah, not. yeah, yeah. I don't think the heat affected me too much on race day. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we learn a lot and we'll be better for it for the uh, months and years to come. Because Tokyo was had the aura of the Paralympics surrounded it, where does that kind of stack up in terms of all the other, because you've, you've raced in Berlin and other places, where's it kind of stack? Was that number one? It's definitely one of the highlights, yeah. that's for sure. And the, the international triathlon scene does race at so many exotic locations around the world. I've been lucky enough to race in France, Turkey, Spain. Oh, wow um switzerland for example um yeah where the races just keep getting better but yeah tokyo forever will be a special Mm. place in my heart that's for sure well what are the other ones that what's what about like paris and um turkey what about them that it's because they're turkey was great for food Um, (laughs) and in the past when i initially did come onto the triathlon australia team um i was told to sort of dial it back a little bit initially and be more of a be more of a racer rather than a tourist <laughs> <laughs> so i've got that out of the system and i'm a bit more i guess professional these days was that when you were a bit younger a bit younger yeah um, no, I got but you know speaking of paris um from what i hear um we're going to race around the eiffel tower oh, um, for, for the paris specific. 2024 paralympics so yeah that definitely a nice, the pain definitely a nice incentive that's for sure yeah wow mm-hmm. so what are the kind of highlights in your career do you have a specific race that was kind of, yeah, probably the race that you kind of have a good result and you were happy with the overall performance of of everything? Oh, I think back to my first race in Tasmania, which was a World Series race. Um, it was a bit of a whirlwind trip. Um, it was only a few days before that I'd officially been classified into the PTS5 yep. category. Um, and I was lucky enough to uh, to win that race. So that's that's my that's my one and only World Series race win. Um, but yeah, like I said, triathlon just races at exotic locations all over the world. I've raced in Besançon, France, which <laughs> raced through this very stereotypical French village. Um, Turkey, like I said, um, amazing food. Switzerland, Lausanne is probably the most picturesque race I've I've done on this beautiful lake with all the glitz and glamour that goes with it um, being in Switzerland. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the, the races just keep getting better. And next year it looks like I'll be racing in Yokohama, Japan, so oh. get my sushi hit again. Um, <laughs> and then a couple of races in France and Spain. So, yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's certainly an added incentive, that's for sure. Yeah. Do you have – what would kind of be if you were to make a race in anywhere, where would you race? Like I'm trying to think, you know, like somewhere like – um, um, Eastern Europe, something like oh, I don't know. I'd love to see more races in Perth. Um, yeah, because you know, I I still believe that Perth's one of the best training environments in the world. Um, typically, a lot of Aussie athletes either 
move over east or move overseas thinking that it's better, better. over there but um or the grass is greener um <laughs> but you know I've, I've raced and trained all over the world and i still think perth's got got everything you know we've got beautiful beaches we've got yeah. perth hills which i'll be riding in tomorrow we've got parks everywhere i've got perry lakes bold park on my doorstep you know i've got the wa institute of sport the gilbray oval you know it's probably renowned yep. as one of the best grass tracks in the world um we're, we're very lucky um so yeah I'm, I'm happy to be based in perth and hopefully one day there's an international mm. um series here well, there you go <laughs> it's a good one yeah just kind of you're talking about riding a bike tomorrow how much kind of uh investment do you play like do you put into a good bike yeah how long's a piece of string i reckon <laughs> my, um, my race wheels for tokyo um were probably about eight thousand dollars retail <sighs> just the wheels um spec you have to spec it up or anything you look at you know even pedals power meter pedals you're probably looking at 1500 bucks just for pedals um so yeah the, the price of bikes has just gone through the roof in the Damn. last um five to ten years and yeah a, a twenty thousand dollar bike's just gonna blend in with with a the crowd these days rather than stand out so yeah you can definitely buy speed with bikes and yeah i was lucky Crazy. enough to be um sponsored by stormflower um winery down in uh, margaret river Ooh. who funded a lot of my race bike um and had some okay. assistance with uh the paralympics australia and yep. the australian institute of sport and we did a lot of work in the wind tunnel in the lead oh, up to yep. To Tokyo to get in the most aerodynamic position, um, you know things like change in different helmets and hand position, and at one stage wow. in the wind tunnel they were even going to shave my the hair off my arm oh. to see if that created any extra drag. So yeah, that elite at that elite level, That's, there's yeah, there's nothing. And I guess because it's the out. sprint, the sprint triathlon as well is like percent one percent makes it or even five percent makes a massive difference because it makes makes a huge difference so yeah you can definitely buy speed in cycling that's for sure Ooh. what would be if you're not like forget about training day or anything like that go to meal like just going to make something that you know family dinner what would be you go to so oh, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for tiramisu. Oh, <laughs> if I uh, if I ever go out for dinner and there's tiramisu on the menu, I've I've just got to try. A good one too. Mm. Just got to try and compare, especially when I'm in Europe. Um, <laughs> I'm also a massive fan of sourdough bread. Yes, um, good fresh man. Good wood fired sourdough bread. It's much more digestible than you know supermarket bread because of the the sourdough life culture. But just it's just beautiful. And yeah, if we're getting adventurous with what we put on top of our bread. In terms of healthy fats, protein, cheese, olive oil, avocado, olive eggs. oil dipped in, in uh, balsamic vinegar as well. Mm. Yeah, simple things like that. I'm a I'm a Perfect. lover of good bread. That's for sure. Yeah, pizzas. You're a oh, I love wood fired pizza. Mm. Um, can't go go to go go past a good wide pizza. Pizza, uh, mozzarella in Wembley. That's always a a, a favourite of mine. I reckon that's mm. probably one of the better ones in Perth. Have you raced at all in Italy or anything like that? Done any? Ah. I think if you race in Europe, there's always good Italian food. Um, anywhere. I haven't raced in Italy specifically, but um, spent a bit of time in Lake Como. Um, okay. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah. So where's the best place you've ever eaten in overseas? Oh, Lake Como is probably pretty yeah. hard to beat or the Amalfi Coast in yeah. Italy. Um, by the seaside, fresh seafood, fresh produce, um, fruit, veg, um, Italian coffee. Yeah, mm. that that's definitely one of my favorites there the amalfi mm -hmm. coast it italy would you ever do the boston marathon is that the boston marathon the big marathon over in america yeah it's one of the more prestigious yeah prestigious one. marathons um have you thought about doing that one day it's it's funny how your mentality changes you yeah know, five years ago i was all about the marathon and yeah. the ironmans and that sort of thing and not anymore now that i've been in the um triathlon australia elite environment yeah. i'm all about trying to push myself and go as hard as i can for for that one hour period so yeah. Yeah, it's all about short course for me at the moment. Yeah, interesting. How much, just thinking about the, the short form, how much kind of more gains do you think you can kind of eke out of yourself? Like is there how much more potential do you think you have have in you to kind of get out? That makes sense, that question. Oh, I'm still pushing for a medal Yeah, in um, Paris. Um, you know, I look at the times that the gold medalist did, swim, bike, run, um, from Tokyo, and I still think on my day that that's possible. So, yeah, we've we've got to we've got to reach for the stars, and yeah, hope for the best. 
And well, how long, what, was, what were the times difference? How how much of a oh, difference was it? There was about three or four minutes um, okay. in it um, between first and seventh. Um, but yeah, things can go pretty quickly or badly for you on race day. So it's just about stringing it all together yeah. between swim, bike, run. Yeah, right. Do you have kind of a point where you wanted to try something new, but you were kind of too you were afraid to try or too scared to try? For race day or? Or just in general, just in anything. Um, in terms of race day, I had full confidence in the team. I yeah. had, I was lucky to have um, a really strong team from WA Institute of Sport and Triathlon Australia, particularly my coach, Daniel Stefano at a low tick pro triathlon. So yeah, no, no second guessing in the last yeah. year. That's for sure. Do you have, oh, so we go, do you have a moment in your kind of training where you, experiment with kind of a new oh, like do you tactic do you make tactics over your run or do you brace pace do you kind of try to practice new things yes yeah, sprint triathlon is definitely more about feel and just yeah um just backing yourself that you've you've got the juice to go as hard yeah. as you can for that one hour period and yeah again that's been the biggest change from iron man to sprint triathlon is is not holding back and yeah, having a crack. So, yeah, that's what I'll keep doing for the next mm-hmm. few years. Do you take any outside of outside of the sport itself? Do you have any other hobbies that you like to kind of take your head away from work? Oh, it's a bit cliche being a dietitian, but I love cooking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, that that that's that's my passion. You ever follow this guy on YouTube? His name, um. Vincenzo's plate. He's an Italian guy. Lives over. In, oh, he's in Sydney, but he's like Italian heritage, and he makes all these Italian recipes, pizzas. He made this tiramisu one recipe. I just thought about just before, and I was like, mm, make that on the weekend. Look him up. He's funny. He does sometimes. He does like review videos of like he was orders Domino's and he like tries it and he's like, oh, like disgusting and all this sort of stuff. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I have to look him up. Look him up. He's 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 a good lad. Uh, final question before I let you go. Um, Comes from my uncle Frank, so and he's another one listener to the podcast. I need to get him a little, little picture yep. put up here. So, <laughs> if money wasn't an object and nothing was impossible, what would you do? I'm a big, I'm a big, cooking. Well, <laughs> I'm a creature habit. Yeah. Um. So I don't think I'd change too much. Um. I I really appreciate um what I have in life right now. Um. I'm passionate about being a sports dietitian. Uh, I love what I do being a triathlete yeah. and I'm so grateful to have the family around me and mm-hmm. yeah, having a two-year-old daughter with my beautiful wife, Leah, um, life's, life's pretty good at the moment. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely very grateful yeah. um, for what I have. Was it the, um, your, cause obviously you had, when you came back from Tokyo, you had the, um, you had to isolate and do all that stuff. You had to, you know, uh, hotel quarantine mm-hmm. and then two weeks and then back out yep that'd have been a nice yeah like seeing I said, family again. Five, five weeks out of hotel yes. quarantine now the novelty still hasn't worn off so yeah you definitely mm. preach the finer things grateful and, in life that's yeah, it's all, grateful. The simple things that's for sure yes <laughs> all right david thank you very much for joining me on the podcast do you want to thank anyone do you want to shout anyone out on the podcast i just have to thank um my, my support team, the WA Institute of Sport and mm-hmm. Triathlon Australia um, for making me the athlete I am today and um, very grateful for the opportunities that's presented to Tokyo and look forward to pushing on to Paris. Awesome. And we can find you on Instagram, social media and all that. David Catalyst Dietitian is my mm-hmm. Instagram handle. So awesome. start there and yeah. Find your way up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you much. Thank you very much again. Um, appreciate your time. And you did the country proud racing Nice and hard, seventh, very well done. Um, Hopefully, onwards and upwards to Paris and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.